First of all, I'd like to thank CAST for commissioning this report on plant breeding and genetics. It's one of the papers in their series on the need for agriculture innovation to sustainably feed the world by 2050. My name is Steve Benziger and I'm at the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. I am the co-chair of this report as is Dr. Rita Mum who is from the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. You will hear more from Rita uh, in a few minutes. We'd like to acknowledge our authors, Rex Bernardo from the University of Minnesota, Charlie Brummer from the University of California, Davis, Peter Langridge from the University of Adelaide, Phil Simon from the USDA ARS and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Stephen Smith from Iowa State University, Richard Flavel, our reviewers are Richard Flavel, Jan Leach, and Don Lee, and of course our cast liaison was Wendy Snick. If you think about the need for innovation in agriculture, there's these three graphs probably sum it up pretty well. Looking at the three great crops of the United States, you can see that corn beginning in 19, roughly 30s to early 40s, had a significant increase in yield. That's due to hybridization and hybrid corn. If you look at the other two crops, soybeans and wheat, you can see that they've had modest gains, but still going upwards since the 1940s also. If you look at the land that they're planted on, you can see that corn was grown very widely in the 1920s, then went down, is now gradually increasing. Wheat uh, has been relatively flat, probably had its highest acreages in the late 1970s, and then has had a slow decline since then. And if you look at soybeans, it's had a very large increase since 1925, probably again also peaked around 1970s, and then has now had a gradual increase recently. Overall, if you look at the total acres planted, you can see 1975 was our peak. And then after that, it went down and then slowly has increased. What this tells us is that the amount of land that can be farmed, the amount of arable land, is slightly increasing, but it's not increasing greatly. So the increases in production more and more are coming from the best genetics, which are what plant breeders work with, and the best agronomy to maximize that genetic on people's farms. The need for this is very clear. It's population driven as well as wealth or affluence driven. If you look at the population of the United States, you can see that it's continuing to increase at a relatively rapid rate, and these we need to be fed. In the 1970s, we had the Green Revolution, and that probably saved one billion people from starvation. And it gave the world 30 to 35 years of food security. Well, we're now 45 years later. And so now we need a second Green Revolution for the next 35 years. And it's basically the nine billion people question. And by 2050, we expect there'll be 9 billion people living in this world, and we need to know, can we feed them? So if, you're familiar with, if you are familiar with the phrase, give us this day our daily bread, and you think about the world of agriculture, this quote, which was written just as the Green Revolution began in the 1970s, may be more relevant to the 21st century than it was to the end of the 20th century, when we expected mass starvation, but it was avoided by the Green Revolution. It is that few scientists think of agriculture as the chief or model science. Many indeed do not consider it a science at all. Yet it was the first science that makes all human life possible. It may be, well be that before the century is over, the success or failure of science as a whole will be judged by the success or failure of agriculture. This was written when we expected mass starvation and famine in the end of the 20th century. In the 21st century, we have a much longer time and we have now used up the first green revolution. 
So then getting back to plant breeding, how does plant breeding work? Well, first of all, you have to define the traits that you need to improve in your crops. Then you have to identify germplasm parents that are, have the needed traits and genes to improve new cultivars. Normally, you'll introduce variation by crossing, but you can do it through other techniques of the chosen parents. Once you have introduced that variation, you need to allow it to separate. That's done through genetic segregation and selecting the outside, outstanding progeny of the crosses. This is repeated for several generations. And when you finally have something which looks very, very good, then you do extensive field testing of selections in multiple environments to determine if they warrant release as a new cultivar or variety. And while we're doing this, we use all of our tools DNA sequencing, genomics, phenomics, statistics, bioinformatics, computing power, modeling, engineering, agronomy, plant pathology, entomology, nutrition and health sciences, flavor and quality chemistry. And because crops are grown as an, in an agroecological area, you have to look at the landscape systems that they're grown in. What are our targets? Well, it's food for people, nutrition, health. It's fiber so that we can have clothing and shelter and, and the like, and paper. It's fuel and the bio-based economy. It's shelter, lumber, etc. And as a scientist, it's also new knowledge. And the framework within which plant breeding works is we create new science and then we apply it. We are scientists. We do create new knowledge and then we apply it. We are an impact science. And I think the quote of Louis Pasteur is as important as ever. No a thousand times no. There does not exist a category of science to which one can give the name applied science. There are science and the applications of science bound together as the fruit to the tree which bears it. We also educate the next generation of plant breeders. We work within government policies and regulations, and we span all research sectors, sectors the public, the private, the non-governmental, the international, and we work with a great or huge diversity of crops that sustain life. Innovation is vital for preparing the next generation of plant breeders. You have to remember, innovation is driven by people. And we must continue to attract the best and the brightest for our industry and for food security and the bio-based economy while enhancing the use of our land. And experiential learning is both vital and critical. Experiential learning is learning by doing. The best way to be a plant breeder is to learn by working and doing plant breeding. The role of sound policies are huge. The plant breeding, like any other science, needs to have a policies that allow it to flourish. Just to give you some examples, in 1810, American foreign officers, our ambassadors, were instructed to collect seeds and plants that may have economic potential for the U.S. In 1862, the Morrill Act forming the land-grant universities was passed. Come back to this one in the next slide. In 1970, Plant Breeders' Rights and the Plant Variety Protection Act enhanced the public sector research to develop improved crops. Just last year, 2016, there was the ratification of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, signed on September 29, 2016. In the future, we're going to need proper regulations and policies to look at genetic engineering, gene editing, and a whole raft of new technologies. Coming back to 1862, the land-grant university system was formed to acquire and preserve information concerning agriculture, which can be obtained by the means of books and correspondence 
and by practical and scientific experiments. How was this funded? The Act for Donating Public Lands to Several States and Territories which may provide colleges for the benefit of agriculture and the mechanic arts. What's important is this was the first federal act to support higher education. It was passed in the middle of the Civil War and passed on July 3rd in 1862. Policies make a difference. We work at the nexus of the public-private connection. Plant breeding is a, of huge commercial importance, and it's a multi-billion dollar companies are involved. The public sector research that's done at universities, at international centers, at foundations, and other non-governmental organizations is also a multi-billion dollar enterprise. How we mesh together, how we work together, mesh our research agendas for the public good, and I mean this in the broadest of all definitions, is absolutely critical. There are never enough resources. We have to work in a way that we can optimize those resources we have from all of our sources. You must understand that plant breeding is a core and vital technology to USA and our agricultural productivity and that partnerships are necessary and desirable for delivering that experiential learning to make sure that we train the best and the brightest plant breedings of the future. Now, what motivates plant breeders? There's three joys. The first time is when you make the cross because that's when you look at the parents and you think of all the possibilities that might occur from that. That's the creativity. The second is when you go out to your field and you look at the selections and you see a line and you know it has got everything it takes to be a variety. You will remember where you were in that field. You'll remember if the sun was shining, if it was cloudy, the wind was blowing. It makes an impact. And then finally the impact is when that line which you saw in your field is now grown on literally millions of acres. And you remember when you held all the seed of it in the palm of your hand. Now, I've talked to you about where we've been. And what you need to remember is a good past is positively dangerous if it makes us content with the present and unprepared for the future. My colleague, Dr. Rita Mum, will now discuss where the future of plant breeding moving forward is going. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. The long-term goal to feed more than 9 billion people by 2050 is imperative. To accomplish this goal, we have to up our game now. So what about other benefits, outcomes, implications, even for the short term, and particularly for the US? We know that innovation creates new businesses and opens new jobs. Innovation generates wealth. What's more, innovation in agriculture sustains, strengthens, and grows a core capacity for the USA, a workforce skilled in maximal and sustainable food production. It's the reason why Americans pay less for their food than people of any other nation. As a percentage of consumer expenditures, Americans spent 6.6% in 2012 on food. This compares to Singapore, where 7.3% of consumer expenditures went to food, Canada, 9.6%, Switzerland, 11%, Japan, 13.8%, Russia, 31.6%, and Pakistan, nearly 50%. The percentage of consumer expenditures spent on food is lowest in the US, largely due to high production levels. Keeping the cost of food low increases discretionary income, which benefits the economy. Furthermore, the U.S. not only trains an ag-focused, tech-savvy workforce for our nation, 
we train a large proportion of the plant breeders across the world. Agriculture is a key consumer, as well as developer, of innovative technology. For example, to mitigate impacts of climate change, technology is being applied to create crop plants with the capacity to scavenge for scarce soil moisture and vital soil nutrients, even in the face of drought. Technology is opening doors for bio-based approaches to expand fuel options. Technology is being applied to monitor soil conditions in individual farmers' fields, to facilitate tailoring of fertilizer applications to provide just what's needed and avoid nitrogen runoff into waterways. Technology enables farmers to maximize their production levels, placing the right seed in just the right place, along with everything else the seed needs to germinate and flourish right from the start. Farmers can access key information about their crop right from their cell phones. For example, optimal planting dates, best harvest times, and market opportunities to sell their crop. In all of this and more, Agriculture leverages scientific advancements in computing power, information management, engineering, molecular biology and genomics, and communication systems. Innovation in plant breeding supports a healthy population. It provides for a diverse array of delicious and nutritious foods within the reach of every American. Furthermore, Plant breeders are intentionally selecting for greater nutritional content and health benefits in some crops. Think broadly with more cancer-fighting power. Innovative agriculture sets us up for health. Wouldn't you rather spend money on proactive health than treating sickness? Innovation to support a healthy population is critical to containing health care costs and especially important to the next generation. Agriculture is a great investment. Studies have shown that every dollar invested in agricultural research and innovation generates $20 in economic activity. That's a great return on investment. So what's required to cultivate and accelerate the pace of agricultural innovation? Here on the Hill, we'd like to spotlight two salient factors within your purview, policies and public research funding. Ag innovation flourishes and provides lasting impacts when supported by sound, effective, science-based policies and regulations. Such a framework empowers innovation, protects assets, enhances investments, supports global markets, all the while ensuring public safety and supporting strong environmental stewardship. We'd like to close with a call to action. As federal budgets are determined, we urge you to maintain high priority for funding of agricultural research. To maximize results and impact, we encourage coordination of federal funding with the private sector. In particular, the private sector has a stake in developing a tech-savvy workforce. To stretch dollars and avoid overlap, we urge high levels of coordination among USDA, NSF, FFAR, a not-for-profit corporation funded with both congressional dollars matched by non-federal funds, and USAID, which plays a vital role in transferring innovative technological solutions to the developing world which fosters peace and insulates communities against disruptive forces. Funding of public research is crucial for the U.S. in maintaining its core capacity in plant breeding. Give the freedom for scientists to explore, discover, provide solutions, and train the next generation of plant breeders to do so. Finally, we encourage you in your governance role to develop and defend guidelines and policies that foster plant breeding and its outcomes, and these need to reflect a global view. Feeding the masses in the years ahead, 
creates an urgency for the here and now. So many are counting on us. In closing, I direct you to the full paper on the need for agricultural innovation in plant breeding and genetics to feed the world by 2050, which is available to you at the CASP website. It's the first in the Ag Innovation Series by CASP. Thank you for your kind attention. Dr. Benzinger and I are happy to field any questions you might have.